In this section, we're going to be doing several things relating to the way private equity funds approach financial analysis. And we're going to divide that in um, how they look at the financial statements, how they make use of uh, ratio analysis, uh, and their attitude to forecasts. In order to best understand how private equity funds do uh, make investments, this module will help you to put yourself in the heads of private equity fund managers and see how they themselves are going to be approaching um, their, their, their analysis of any potential company and therefore understanding this will better increase the chances for the company to raise private equity finance. Speaking in general, private equity fund managers are very good at cutting through the noise, cutting through the non-essential and getting to the most important drivers of value. And in the case of financial statements, this means looking at operating profits, which is the purest measure of the business. In terms of financial ratios analysis, it means they look at the essential investment ratios and leverage and, and debt ratios. In terms of forecasting, they're good at uh, cutting out the hockey stick forecasts and uh, adjusting for over-optimistic views. In this model, we have uh, three objectives. Before we discuss these, we uh, assume that most people uh, who are going to be taking this module have some prior background in finance and have uh, covered uh, a basic course on financial statement analysis and ratios analysis which will have covered the uh, general range of ratios, which will enable us to focus a little bit more this uh, module on the key S elements which are looked at by the private equity funds rather than being a general presentation of the topic. We have three different um, sections. The first section is uh, analysis of financial statements and what are the aspects of financial statements which are particularly important to private equity fund managers of which uh, advisors to companies should be aware. Secondly, what are the key ratios used by private equity fund managers and their analysis? And this is where um, EBITDA and investment ratios uh, come, to the come to the forefront. And finally, forecasting the financial statements where what is relevant are the two important perspectives of the private equity fund manager. First one being skepticism of the forecasts by companies and secondly the exit driven approach which will enable them to uh, envision the, how the company may look at exit point in four or five years time. In this first section we consider financial statement analysis um, from the perspective of a potential investor and particularly a private equity investor uh, and so alongside of the, uh, the general points made in this section uh, another thing uh, PE investors are quite uh, attuned to is the fact that companies, uh, particularly in, in some jurisdictions, may have two sets of accounts, uh, being the, 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 the first one being those for the tax man uh, and the second ones being the, the real accounts. And uh, if this is in, in fact the case, this is something that most private equity funds are able to work with. Let's make a few uh, general points in order to best set the stage for this section. What are the key drivers or the most salient points with respect to financial statements for private equity investors? Well, firstly, they're important to raise private equity investment. Uh, like any other investor, private equity fund managers um, are going to be relying on financial statements being accurate and not misleading. However, having said that, private equity fund managers compared to most investors are much better at working with slightly defective financial statements and uh, seeing through them or improving them so that will, will not necessarily deter their investment if they do feel that the company is a particularly attractive asset. So private equity fund managers have more flexibility in working with financial statements than others. The types of financial statements are going to include obviously the balance sheet and, and the income statement and derive from that the cash flow statement. Um, we're going to look at what are the key aspects of the financial statements are important to private equity fund managers. 
Accountants and advisors can play an important role because if you are able to anticipate some of the needs of the PE fund managers and prepare materials uh, to reflect this anticipation of the need, it's going to vastly increase the chances of the PE fund manager being willing to put in the time to analyze the investment. So this is uh, somewhere where an advisor can add a lot of value. Uh, an important part of that is persuading the company that it's a worthwhile exercise. The particular elements of financial statements and their relevance to private equity deals would include um, basically the uh, operating profit measures, um, the growth in sales, what PE fund managers are looking for is growth, potential, uh, industrial solidity as measured by EBITDA, and they can work in a flexible way with different financial uh, structures or, or, or with debt problems. When we consider which financial statements should be um, the object of analysis by PE managers or which financial statements are available, we can of course uh, notice that uh, historical financial statements will be available in different forms ranging from uh, statutory accounts prepared for regulatory purposes to uh, audited accounts if the company has an audited which would be audited according to uh, international auditing standards as well as kind of pro forma and um, internal uh, financial accounts or management reporting accounts and so forth all of these will be of interest to to the fund manager um, they will be looking to see if they're consistent with each other and whether there are any obvious uh, deficiencies in some of the financial statements may, which may create a liability in the future. Prospective financial information uh, in uh, emerging markets, particularly in the mid-cap sector, it's quite uh, possible that uh, the company is not prepared any very meaningful forecasts and that's something that the P manager is able to work with. They may be looking to develop their own forecasts, but of course, if the um, advisor to the companies has been able to create some forecasts, that will definitely be welcome. The guiding rule being keep it simple and credible rather than complicated and incredible. Now, if I'm a fund manager and I meet uh, a company owner and this person hands over to me a load of financial statements, I'm going to pretty much take them with a big grain of salt. Oh, I'm going to be wondering, uh, you know, if any of it is particularly real. And I'm also going to be asking myself if this uh, company owner is even able to explain them. I may uh, come across the finance manager of the company, discovers this person is a chief accountant and unable to explain in a very sophisticated way many of the aspects of the financial statements, particularly the forecasts. And so if there is a uh, advisor who is at a level of competence superior to that of a chief accountant and can engage in this uh, process, this will add a lot of comfort and credibility from the point of view of the private equity fund manager. And um, short of a full sell side due diligence, there are still many things that a, um, an, a, an effective advisor can do, which we've uh, listed here. Um, generally, what it boils down to is whether this advisor can put some of his know-how and credibility and inject this into the financial statements to give them an upgrade or a, uh, a level of credibility and comfort, which will make the P investor more inclined to put in the time to analyze them. Well, the question of why financial statements are important in private equity is answered well they're important everywhere of course uh, and like any other investor private equity fund managers are going to be looking at financial statements well, they're going to be looking at it from their very specific point of view which has some pluses for the company which means they're quite ready to work with rougher financial statements if they think that the um they think the the investment opportunity is worth it and on the minus side perhaps for the company owner is that they will uh be able very quickly to get to the essence and discover any over optimistic forecasts or misleading facts. Product investors are very skilled. Why? Because they are highly trained financially. That's one reason. The second reason is that they have a lot of experience of reviewing investments uh, day in, day out. 
And so if they're looking at a specific company, the chances are they've looked at three or four companies in the same sector already before, and they know what to look for. And this is a skill uh, which is uh, very important for private equity investors. They will also be able to apply their past experience. In other words, they may have invested in these similar companies, held that investment for years, seen how things are going to evolve. And so they will see patterns which the company owner or even their advisor may not be able to see. So you have to be prepared. And if the company does have an advisor working for them, the P fund manager will expect the advisor to be engaged, prepared, and to have influence over the, over, the, over the company owner. If a private equity fund manager sees an advisor has a role as purely technical and, and does not seem to have a lot of influence or uh, professional uh, input, they will not consider them uh, a relevant part of the, of the equation when assessing the investment opportunity. So any advisor has to establish themselves with their client the PE fund manager cannot do it for them. There are going to be certain areas of focus in, in private equity, which um, are relating to financial statements. In the income statement, uh, the PE fund manager is really uh, concentrated on looking at whether um, the financial statements reflect the fact that there's a good market for the company's products or services, and whether the company is able to manage their business effectively from an industrial perspective first before looking at the financial perspective and from the point of view of that EBITDA is a main focus why because EBITDA measures the ability to generate sales to win customers it measures the ability to source uh, raw material inputs at a good price which gets us to grow for gross profit it measures the ability of the company to manage their fixed costs and overheads which gets us to uh, profit before depreciation and amortization and it measures the ability of management to make the right, right capex decisions and that gets us to EBITDA. When we're looking at the balance sheets, what we're looking at is a stable, uh, a stable situation uh, and so the levels of debt are going to be important. Although a company with high debt, if they do have a good business underlying, the PE fund manager is going to be okay with that because that will be an opportunity for him to uh, invest and reduce the debt levels and make the company more sustainable. And when we look at the ratio analysis, the P fund manager is looking more at the operating profit ratios, as well as the, um, the leverage and financial ratios on the balance sheet side and the investor return measures and the kind of more operating ratios like working capital and inventory days and all the rest of it are going to be left more as a secondary uh, operating kind of approach, not the primary uh, investment perspective. And when we talk about forecasting, Again, it's about making sure forecasts are credible because uh, the fact is that uh, the great majority of SMEs forecasts, particularly in emerging markets, tend not to be credible. Now, this is a being a private equity course. It's not obviously specifically a, a finance course. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a few items which are of particular importance to private equity investors. And we're going to uh, say a few words about these. Uh, one is shareholders' equity. Obviously, a private equity investor is going to put their money into a capital increase, and so some understanding of shareholders' equity and its dynamics is important. Also, goodwill, which is an item we'll find particularly in venture-type investments, where the company doesn't have many assets, and so the understanding of how goodwill is treated and thought about by private equity investors is important. And then gross profit, which is the, an operating industrial measure of the company's performance. EBIT. Uh, which is earnings before interest and tax, which is also an important operating measure. And then finally, EBITDA, which is perhaps the most important uh, financial indicator that is focused upon by private equity investors. So we're going to be reviewing these in a specific way in this module. The third part of the balance sheet is shareholders' equity. And this refers to the money which has been invested by the shareholders in the company. And this can be com comprised of several components. The original money invested when the companies, the shares were originally issued by the company, plus the profits that have been retained in the company that is not paid out in the form of in the form of dividends. And the equity holders are the people who own the company, appoint the management, and take the risks of the company in the case of losses. Goodwill has 
substantial limitations. Goodwill is not an asset that can be sold or factored. A company cannot enter into a sale lease pact of its goodwill. And essentially, goodwill is not a separable asset that management can either convert into cash or use to raise cash uh, against that asset. Gross profit is the profit a company makes after deducting the costs associated with the making and selling of its products or the costs associated with providing its services. It is the difference between the aggregate cost of the materials and production and the revenue the organization receives for selling its products and or services to its customers. It is calculated as sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, is the surplus the organization makes on its day-to-day -day operations. It takes into account both the expenses the organization incurs when making the sales, the direct expenses discussed previously, and the more general operating expenses needed to run the business. These expenses are often fixed. They would be incurred whatever the organization's sales volumes. They include administrative and sales staff salaries, office electricity, cleaning and insurance, and are required for the business to operate. Gross profit, minus distribution costs, minus administration expenses, minus depreciation, minus other operating costs, equals net operating income, known as EBIT. Question one. Net sales minus the cost of goods sold equals, please select one, A, gross profit, B, EBIT, C, profit for the financial year. How real are the numbers? In this section, we look at some of the accounting problems which may distort the effectiveness of accounting reporting. Bona fide profits versus accounting profits. After a company earns a bona fide profit, its owners are wealthier than they were beforehand. We contrast this to an accounting profit, which is what the accounting rule says it is, but doesn't represent anything further. This chart provides a visual representation of cash flow and the life cycle of a company. So as the company is young, we see that it depends very much on financing. And as the company gets more mature and generates cash, the financing declines. If we look at the operating results uh, at the beginning, these are negative and then they, they go to positive and then go down and decline. And the cash flow broadly matches these operating results, assuming that the operating results are not uh, subject to any kind of irregularity. Cash flow in the company life cycle. Business enterprises typically go through phases of development. Introductory stage companies subsist primarily on financing. Growth companies can be highly profitable, but they require expensive external capital to keep funding their expansion. Mature companies may achieve less impressive profit margins. They become self-funding and ultimately net generators of cash. Declining companies reach a point at which deteriorating cash flows from operating and investing activities cause them to become net cash users. They cannot fill the gap with external financing because they represent a poor credit risk and offer unattractive returns to equity investors. Financial flexibility. Cash flow statements provide essential information about a firm's financial health. Questions such as, how safe are the company's dividends? Could the company fund its needs internally if external sources of capital suddenly became scarce or prohibitively expensive? Would the company be able to continue meeting its obligations if its business turns down sharply? These are three of the most fundamental questions that any investor would ask of a company from the cash flow perspective. Comparative ratio analysis. To compare a company's ratio with those of a peer group, we use two techniques for resolving the trade-off between the strict comparability and the adequate sample size. The first technique is to compare the company against a reasonably homogeneous industry peer group. 
The second technique is ranking a company within a rating peer group. A rating peer group can include a variety of industries within a broadly defined economic sector. Ratio trend analysis. In evaluating the long range creditworthiness of cyclical companies, some analysts focus on cycle to cycle rather than year to year trends. It can be difficult to distinguish a normal cyclical decline from a more permanent deterioration without the benefit of hindsight. Management can be portraying a permanent reduction in profitability as a routine cyclical slump. What I hope you're enjoying this uh, module. If you are, I'd really appreciate if you could consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks very much. What are the limitations of ratio analysis? It is important to know whether the company has changed its accounting policies over time. If this is the case, it may help to make adjustments in order to improve comparability over time. Prices change over time owing to inflation or deflation. Therefore, when comparing financial statements numbers over several years, adjustments for inflation or deflation rates may be useful. The general economic situation may have changed from boom to bust or vice versa, in which case it may be difficult to establish a base year from which to start the comparison. Changes in specific regulations or technology may affect the product markets in which the firm operates. When conducting cross-sectional analysis, it is important to be aware of differences in accounting policies between different companies. In this section, we review the main types of financial ratios and we illustrate how these can be used in order to gain insight into the performance of a company. Debt to equity ratio. The debt to equity ratio is calculated by dividing a company's total liabilities by its shareholders' equity. These numbers are available on the balance sheet of a company's financial statements. The ratio is used to evaluate a company's financial leverage. It is a measure of the degree to which a company is financing its operations through debt versus wholly owned funds. More specifically, it reflects the ability of shareholders' equity to cover all outstanding debts in the event of a business downturn. It's calculated as following. Total liabilities divided by total equity. What constitutes total debt? At one time, it was appropriate to consider only long-term debt in leverage calculations for industrial companies, since short-term debt was generally used for seasonal purposes, such as financing Christmas-related inventory. This principle no longer holds in recent years. However, as many companies rely heavily on short-term debt that they neither repay on an interim basis nor fund. Such short-term debt must be viewed as permanent and included in the leverage calculation. Borrowers sometimes argue that the total calculation should exclude debt that is convertible. The best practice is to count convertible debt in total debt, but to consider the possibility of conversion according to the circumstances. Preferred stock is a security that further complicates the leverage calculation. A preferred stock may have a sinking fund provision, uh, in the case of perpetual preferred stock, another preferred security, exchangeable preferred stock, these can be transferred into debt at the issuer's option. The credit an analyst must recognize the heightened level of risk implied by the presence of preferred stock in the capital structure. Total debt plus preferred stock plus preference stock divided by total debt plus minority interest plus preferred stock plus preference stock plus common equity. Lease obligations enable companies to obtain many of the benefits of debt financing without violating covenanted limitations on debt. One of the most important things to consider is the importance of management's attitude towards borrowing and debt. Some management teams will rely on a so-called bait and switch technique. The managers institute new policies that aimed at improving cash flow and pay down short-term borrowings. On the strength of the favorable impression of these actions, the company floats new long-term bonds at an attractive rate. Once the cash is in the coffers, the management loses its motivation to present a conservative face to lenders and reverts to aggressive financial policies. When man management's probable future actions are taken into account, the company's prospects for repaying its debts on schedule may be better or worse than the ratio implies. Hence the importance of looking at the track record of management, how they behave towards debt in the past, and getting an opinion on that.
Operating margins show how well management has run the business before taking into account the financial policies and the tax rate. It's calculated as following, operating income divided by sales. The fixed charge coverage ratio. This measures the ability of a company's earnings to meet the interest payments on its debt. It's used to examine the extent to which fixed costs consume the cash flow of a business. It shows how many times a business can pay for its fixed costs with its earnings before interest and taxes. The ratio is most commonly applied when a company has incurred a large amount of debt and must make ongoing interest payments. A low ratio is a strong indicator that any subsequent drop in the profits of a business may bring about its failure. A high ratio indicates that a business can safely use more debt to fund its growth. In other words, it has a cushion in place. It is calculated as following, net income plus income taxes plus interest expenses divided by interest expenses. Key investment ratios. These ratios are primarily used for comparison purposes by investors. A higher investment ratio is better. An equity investor has a different perspective from a debt investor. Equity. Equity investors are looking to take on the risks of ownership by becoming shareholders in a company by putting their capital at risk. They are looking for a return commensurate with these risks. That will be expressed in two ways. Capital returns, i.e. an increase in the value of the shares, and income returns from regular dividends. Debt. Debt investors or lenders look for a fixed or floating interest in return for a loan to the company and expect the return of their capital in full at the end of the loan period. These lenders rank ahead of equity holders in any liquidation of the company. Return on assets, ROA. This ratio measures how efficiently profits are being generated from the assets employed in the business. It will have meaning only when compared with the ratios of similar organizations. A low ratio in comparison with industry averages indicates an inefficient use of business assets. It is calculated as following, ROA equals net profit divided by average total assets multiplied by 100. Return on equity, ROE. It is the most important ratio of all as it tells you whether or not the effort put into the business is, in addition to achieving the strategic objectives, generating an appropriate return on the equity generated. It is al calculated as follows. ROE equals net income divided by shareholders' equity multiplied by 100. Let's take this example and use this to um, map out a typical private equity investment and how we may use ratios to, to analyze the effect of the investment. And so what we're looking at here is using ratios specifically for a private equity type situation. In this case, uh, let's assume that you are um, an investment officer or an advisor to the company and the uh, private equity fund is, in, is negotiating to, to invest into a manufacturing company. Uh, but we have a typical private equity situation of the company is, is basically industrially sound, but has made some has some weaknesses in its management, and has run up quite a lot of debt, but uh, basically has a sound foundation for further growth. And to do have that further growth, it requires major new investments. So what we're talking about is a typical private equity situation where we have a little bit of management strengthening, some uh, strengthening of the capital by reducing debt and providing some resources for future expansion. So a mix of three different factors in this case. Um, we've developed a plan for the company and we're planning to make a, an equity injection in early 2016. Let's assume we are in late 2015. So on this slide you can see the financial plan um, it's a fairly typical plan you might find in an equity, uh, private equity growth investment. You see the sales are uh, growing reasonably well. Uh, it's not a high growth uh, venture type investment, but it's a solid growth investment and a general across the board improvement in the financial results such as EBITDA and the profit after tax, as well as a reduction in debt. And so 
this uh, these forecasts tell us in general that it's uh, going in a positive way but let's specifically look at some extra insight we may able to be able to develop quickly by making the use of ratios uh, one thing just to notice you'll notice on the line called equity you see the equity jumps from 10 to 40 in 2016 that corresponds to the capital increase of 30 million so let's um, proceed with a ratios analysis now one of the, the the first things we need to do is decide which ratios analysis to do because there's a wide number of them and so what we've chosen is uh, a bit of a spread across the different uh, categories the the six categories being returns uh, profitability, turnover, liquidity, leverage, and coverage. And so um, on returns, um, uh, we've chosen return on equity, and you can see this sort of uh, jumps and then reaches a kind of steady state of about 20% a year. EBITDA margin, you notice, goes from 5% after the investment to 16% um, after three years. The net income margin also gradually rises and, and stabilizes at around 10%. Asset turnover remains more or less the same as before. Um, the current ratio uh, remains the same as before. The quick ratio also, but it jumps quite a bit at the end in 2022. The leverage ratio falls quite significantly, which uh, indicates that the capital increase. And the um, ratio of EBITDA to interest expense goes up significantly and the net debt to EBITDA ratio falls uh, significantly and so let's look at these ratios and, and choose the ones that tell um, the strongest story and the ones that are not really telling us uh, very much the ones that are telling me a lot is EBITDA margin it goes from 5% in 2015 up to 2000 up to 16% 2018 this tells me that my management improvement program has worked after a three-year cycle the net income margin doesn't tell me very much because it contains other items. The asset, total asset turnover doesn't tell me very much because it just tells me that the assets of the business are being used properly as, 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 uh, as in the past. The uh, interesting one uh, on the coverage is the fact that the net debt to EBITDA goes so low and the interest coverage ratio is very, very high. What that tells me is after three years, there is scope for using more debt. So in other words, I could either contemplate an exit after three years because I've completed a three-year restructuring of the EBITDA margins or I could stay with the company somewhat longer but after three years do a kind of leverage recapitalization of the company because it's not very efficient for the company to have so little debt and that's what the ratios tell me so in conclusion the ratios that are most important for me to draw conclusions are the EBITDA margin net debt to EBITDA and EBITDA to interest expense what is EBITDA EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. EBITDA is one of the indicators which is the most popular with private equity fund managers. And therefore, let's examine this. EBITDA has become a, a major fixture in securities analysis. It's very popular with private equity investors. Many practitioners now consider the ratio synonymous with cash flow or more formally operating cash flow. Analysts have found that the best single predictor of bankruptcy was a declining trend in the ratio of cash flow to debt. Adding working capital to cash flow analysis frequently reveals problems that may not be apparent from observing EBITDA trends. EBITDA can be abused. It can provide valuable insight when used properly. Over a full operating cycle, the capital expenditures reporting in a company's statements of cash flow are ordinarily at least as great as the depreciation charges shown on its income statement. The D in EBITDA is a safety valve that the corporate treasurer can use if EBIT belows, falls below I for a short term. In such conditions, the company can temporarily reduce its capital spending. Depreciation is not, after all, available as a long-run long source of cash for interest payments. The applications and limitations of EBITDA. Users of financial statements had discovered certain limitations in net income as a valuation tool. Similar companies with similar net income can have substantially different total enterprise value. 
Companies with similar interest coverage can have substantially diff different default risk. EBITDA can discriminate among companies that look similar when judged in terms of EBIT. Taking EBITDA into account enables analysts to discriminate between the two similar looking credit risks. The usefulness is in ensuring comparability of companies with dissimilar depreci depreciation policies when estimating the total enterprise values. Question two, what measure is the fixed charge coverage ratio? It measures the ability of a company's earnings to meet the interest payments on its debt. It measures management's skill in buying and selling at advantageous prices. It shows how well management has run the business before taking into account financial policies and the tax rate. It measures the amount of net profit a company obtains per dollar of revenue gained. Exercise 3.1, constructing financial ratios from a set of accounts. In this section of the module, we consider the challenges and peculiarities of forecasting and modeling in a private equity transaction context. Pro forma financial statements. Another way that can be looked forward with financial statements is to consider pro forma statements that reflect significant developments prior to the reflection of these developments in published statements. It can be important to determine quickly whether news that flashes across the screen will have a material impact on a company's financial condition. Pro forma statements for acquisitions. Detailed in income statements and balance sheets that companies provide in connection with major corporate transactions, which are used to notify investors of material unscheduled events. The key column is labeled pro forma adjustments. Some adjustments have a genuine economic impact. The later is the reclassification of items that the acquire and the acquire account for differently. For the most part, the company provided pro forma adjustments, take cares of accounting niceties. In the light of its limitations, a company provided pro forma statement provides only a starting point for assessing the impact of a major merger, acquisition or divestment. So let's review some of the key principles of modeling good practice. Forecasts must be consistent with historical performance and the current sector outlook. One tends to analyze historic numbers in relation to others and develop ratios, particularly operating ratios. Forecasts are by their nature approximations. It's important to focus on the big picture and not to get lost in trivial details. In private equity forecasting in particular, one should look more closely at the evolution of more mature companies in the sector and then combine a top-down approach looking at the evolution of market share with a bottom-up approach looking at capacity constraints. And some business it'll be, which are scalable, it's more important to look at the market share, like for example, a software business, in some cases where the, the business is capacity constrained, like a, a power generation company, then it should be a bottom-up approach. If the forecast looks too good to be true, then it certainly is, and we should avoid the hockey stick, and we'll discuss that in the next slide. One term you'll hear very much in private equity and venture capital, and in, indeed other areas, is the so-called hockey stick forecast. The hockey stick forecast is, looks like a hockey stick because the line is flat for quite a long time and then suddenly curves upwards. Now there is a legitimate part of an explanation for this, which is the following, that as the company is gearing itself up for expansion, like uh, investing in working capital or buying machinery, it's going to take a while for the customers really to arrive and get the confidence and therefore it will be flat and then as uh, the company, the customers come in, then things will kind of take off. However, there was a second element to it, which causes the hockey stick to be more concave than it should be. And this is the behavioral explanation, because if I'm a manager of the company, the flatter the curve is at the beginning period, the less pressure I am, and the more likely I am to keep my job. And so the tendency of management from a behavioral point of view is to make the hockey stick more concave than it needs to be. And an appropriate haircut and making the, the hockey stick more convex should be applied. We have seen that the private equity approach to valuation is exit driven. In corporate finance and project finance models, the terminal value is a smaller percentage of the total value. And models in corporate finance and project finance tend to use a projection of the final year cash flow with some growth assumptions. 
Sometimes it can be a two-step steady growth period and then uh, uh, an assumption that cash flows grow at the rate of growth of GDP forever. In private equity, because all the value pretty much is in the terminal value, this terminal value must be more articulated. And as we've seen, the best approach has been to create a table of values based upon different exit scenarios. So finally, I'd like to uh, express my thanks to the World Bank for allowing me to share a version of the course that I developed with them and put it online uh, on my uh, website, on my LinkedIn profile. So thanks for that. Secondly, um, all the modules, this module and all further modules will have a certain amount of case studies and additional materials attached to the module, which are part of the learning experience. These materials I will be posting on a specially created group that I have made in LinkedIn called Gavin Ryan PE Course. Uh, all you have to do is search Gavin Ryan PE Group and the, 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 the group will come up for you to join. Um, you uh, uh, who are following this course, you'll be eligible to join my group and get these additional materials once you've connected to me on LinkedIn and once you've subscribed to my YouTube channel. So when I receive a request to join this group, I will check these two things and then I will admit to you to the group. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this module and I look forward to seeing you on the next module.